there was no outcome besides death if they engaged us. They knew that we were hunting and yeah. we were there for a fight. So we were far enough in the war and people knew who we were that they knew it wasn't worth engaging. And that was like legitimately middle of the nowhere deployment. The timeline for us to get to a level of care was like 36 hours. Like if a guy got hurt where we were at, that's how long it would take to get him somewhere. All that knowledge that I gained on like what it takes to live and operate in the mountains, we got to use that offensively against guys that had to use the mountains to move in the country. So it was like, I don't know, it's just like righteous. Like it, it feels good to kill ISIS guys. You know, there's no qualms about it. You know, there's, I'm not happy about everybody that, that gets killed. It'd be great if that wasn't the answer all the time, but when it's ISIS, it is the answer. And yeah, no qualms about yeah, it. Very black. Yeah, yeah. Very black and white. Yeah. yeah, the more we kill, the better. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent 20 years on active duty in the United States Army, 15 of which was with Special Forces. He did two Afghanistan deployments, two Africa deployments, and two Iraq deployments. He's a mountain operations specialist to the highest degree. Uh, right now, he's uh, running the institutional government team lead for Ketone IQ, which is a sponsor of the show. And he taught Grizzly Adams and Jeremiah Johnson how to mountain man. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome <laughs> to the stage, Brian Ray. Thanks for the, the warm introduction. <laughs> yeah. Uh, warm, wet, and soft introduction. Yeah, perfect. Uh, what is your best childhood memory? Oh, geez. Man, that's, you hit me with something tough right off the bat. Uh, I'd have to say it would be, uh, I did a lot of traveling when I was younger. Um, my mom's always been kind of a vagabond, so... Um, we spent some time in Europe. We'd go to Italy, but w whenever we'd go to trips, it was always like we were always in hostels. We were always like the cheapest way we could do it because it's not like by getting the full experience. Yeah, so it's not like in any way that we were just like bougie about it and going all over the place. But yeah. uh, with that, I, I guess it would just be those trips because like the amount of experience that I was able to get and see the different cultures and experience that, um, especially like on the grind, you know, yeah. like living with families and hostels from like all these small places. Um, Probably just that in general, all encompassing memory wise yeah. would be like just doing those trips. Dude, that's cool as yeah. shit, man. What a what a valuable way to grow up because I, I think uh, if there's one thing that our children generate generationally lack here in the United States now, it's that it's a lack of perspective, you yeah. know, of, of how the rest of the world is and, and Big time. you know how things are here comparatively and whatever. I, I think it would be we'd be far better off as a nation if uh, more more parents did that. Yeah. You know, if we, comparison, you know, they say comparison is the thief of joy. But I think if you use it the other way, too, you can realize that you've got it pretty good. Yeah. You know, every time I've gone to a place where it's, like, just really poor conditions and you see how happy the people can still be and you see, like, hey, man, this kid's, like, seven-year-old and he's running his own goat herd yeah. and that's his role. And these people are happy. Yeah. And then you come here and people are like, oh, my freaking iPhone died. Like, yeah. it's the worst day ever. It's like, yeah. man. My dad took my iPhone from me. It's like, Jesus, yeah. it doesn't sound that bad to me. Yeah, I know so. it. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> Uh, what's the last book that you read and finished? Uh, geez, I'm a horrible book finisher. I'm a pretty good book starter. You have like 19 half half read books. Yeah, pretty there. much. I like get going and then I get onto something else. But um, so I'm actually my current book is it's a uh, Brain Energy by Dr. Chris Palmer. Um, as I started getting more into the space of like, I wouldn't say neurophysiology. Like I'm like a, a genius that I'm not, but I work with a lot of people who are, and tying that into like TBI and mental health stuff, it's yeah. like super intriguing to me as we get into like alternative medicines and different treatments and really understanding the problems like so that's kind of where i'm at right now is just trying to figure more and more you know how to help out in that space so yeah. that's that's the book i'm currently on yeah i got you uh your morning routine on a normal day when you're actually in town so in town um wake up at six start getting my kids ready for school Once no I cold wake, plunge i haven't gotten there yet all right <laughs> so uh i do cold plunge in the morning um so I've got a, a little sunroom that's that's non-heated. So in the winter season, it's my natural cold plunge. So I'll wake them up. I'll go get in anywhere from like three to five minutes, depending on, you know, how much ice I have to break. Um, Do you keep track of the temperature? I mean, obviously, not, if you're breaking ice, not it's really. It's freezing, like, yeah, it's generally under 40. It, what um, about in the summertime? 
yeah, in the summer I just don't do it. Oh, I just okay. do, I just stick to cold showers. Yeah. Um, it's funny as I started doing I started doing that years ago. Like even before COVID, I was already taking cold showers because I just started doing it because I liked it as a challenge. Like man, I like to be able to just get in and suck it up. It's a good way to start the day. Yeah. But then I started seeing how much like benefit there was as far as like increasing white blood cells and not getting sick as often. So it just became part of my routine to only take cold showers. And now it's like it's like a really big thing. Like everyone's yeah. doing it. Yeah. How long do you cold shower for? Um, just enough to do the job. Like yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't get in and like just sit there and enjoy it. Like I just yeah. do the job, get out and get going. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to take a, a quick break. I, I do want to let you guys know, um, the way that you can support the show is to support our sponsors. Uh, I know some people don't like to hear ads, but, uh, that's how I do what I do for a living. So, uh, any support you can show for our gracious sponsors is much appreciated. And again, it does, uh, does support the show. So thank you. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. To me, that like that's the most reasonable way to do it. I mean, I know there's like twenty thousand dollar fucking chiller tanks, you know, that look like furniture, and, oh, yeah. and then there's you know fake barrels and, and everything in between. And people buy like troughs and, and whatever. To me, I, I just stick to the showers year round. Yeah, you know? like it's cold enough to, to fucking suck. It is, yeah. You know, it, like is it thirty eight degrees? No, but I tell you, it, it, it's not fun getting in it. You no, know? it's not. Um, even if it's fucking 68 degrees, like that's still cold enough, you know, to, to shove your balls into your throat and, and <laughs> yeah. not want to be in it, you know? Exactly. So, uh, to yeah. me, I think it's kind of splitting atoms like, well, it needs to be under 54 degrees. And for this, you know, like I spend two minutes every morning, you know, and, and as cold as the water will go in the summertime, it's a little warmer, but it's fucking way hotter out. So yeah. you know, the contrast is still there and, and, and it serves me well, but I'm not trying to hijack the thing. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. More routine. No, no. Yeah. So, um, it's just, Real quick, say what's funny is what got me into that is we actually started doing not I wouldn't say cold plunges for like wellness for the military, but in one of our training events, we put guys in the ice as a survival aspect to it. Yeah. So, and I guess as we get in the mountain stuff, we can kind of go in detail on that. But like yeah. that was the first time I'd really like gone into that cold water, and I just realized how much I enjoyed it. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So morning routine continued on. So I've done my cold plunge, go shower, get ready, come downstairs, and by then, my first two rounds of kids have eaten and they're ready to go to school so i leave about quarter to seven take them to school come back next two rounds of kids who are getting ready to go to uh elementary school um, either i'll take them or my wife will take them to school and i'll, I'll start getting to work so um, i usually put in work first thing in the morning and then after lunch is really when my workouts start that's when i like to do my runs or workouts um then go pick up kids and get on with the routine, whether they've got sports or whatever else. So, do you not eat in the first half of the day? Uh, not that often. If I do, it's usually just like something quick. Um, I'll cook up some sausage or eggs or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't like I don't like jump to jump to eat right away. I try not to eat as traditionally as like, hey, there's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You have to eat those times. Um, I've kind of shifted more towards I fuel for necessity. Like, hey. I'm going to do this. So I need to make sure I eat something that can get me through to this. Yeah. And, and it's, it's kind of helped a little bit. You know? Yeah. Do you subscribe to any particular eating style or does that also depend on what you're, what you have going on? Yeah. At this point, at this point I've got more <clears throat> neutral. Um, I've gone, I've gone strict keto just cause I wanted to try it out. Um, I want to see what it was like. And, and granted, I really liked the way I felt when I was on it. The, the weight loss is like fantastic on it, but it's a little bit harder to maintain. And I don't necessarily like eating different from my kids all the time. Like yeah. I still want to enjoy pizza night with my kids. Like I sure. want to eat pizza occasionally. Yeah. Like when a freaking eight cases of Girl Scout cookies show up, like I want half of them. I want to eat some Girl Scout cookies too. So, yeah. you know, it's kind of like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll treat myself occasionally. So I'm not super strict on it. Um, yeah. but I also understand like what I've done to my body when I've done that. It's like, Hey, I took this. I know it's probably gonna make me not feel that great yeah. or I'm going to have to work this hard to, to get back to like, neutral for myself so yeah that yeah, no, makes good sense um all right so in terms of where you grew up I, obviously you said your mom was a vagabond um I'd, I'd like to talk just a little bit about your childhood and backstory where did you grow up and and talk to me about kind of the the childhood experience from your perspective 
Yeah. So I guess pretty unique looking back on it as I compare it to other people I've, I've met. But um, so I was born on Fort Bragg at Womack, which anyone who's been there is familiar with Womack. Um, I was born there while my dad was going through the Q course. He was a, he was a team guy as well. Wow. Um, not long after my parents had separated, uh, I went and lived with my grandparents in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So, which is like full on Amish town. It's like the, uh, like Amish mafia. I think that's where it was filmed, like right around that area. So, um, I grew up there. Uh, well, I wouldn't say grew up. I was there for a number of years. Then I moved to Germany, I lived in Germany and went to kindergarten there. German was my first, like my first like real language. Um, do you speak it fluent now? No, I don't. No, that's one thing I wish, I wish my grandparents and parents would have insisted on is that I kept using it. Yeah. But once I moved back to the States, I just never used it. And it was just nothing but remnants left from there. Yeah. So from there, I uh, moved to Missouri, spent some time there because my mom had, had met another guy and we were living there. So I was in St. Charles and St. Louis for a short while. After that, I think I was about 13 years old. Um, my mom said, do you want to, you want to go live with your dad? I was like, I I guess I don't know him. It, so that was, yeah, was <laughs> going to be my question is in yeah. that first 13 years, did you have almost no contact? Zero contact. Zero contact. I didn't know anything about him except he was an army guy. Wow. That's all I knew. Um, and, and it wasn't like a, they didn't have like a toxic relationship. It wasn't just like, she wasn't like constantly like shitting on him or anything. It wasn't like that, but, um, he was doing his thing and we were doing our thing. So she was like, Hey, do you want to go live with your dad in Germany again? I was like, sure why not like yeah. <laughs> okay wow so uh we moved to germany um we stayed at a we were at like a real small town it was an awesome little military base it was in bad eibling it was like maybe 150 people there so wow. it was like deep south bavaria um beautiful country so i was there through middle school um after that my dad got stationed back at 10th group and that's when i moved to colorado springs and started high school so that's what that was my like when I say I'm from Colorado Springs, like that's where I tie it to. I moved there in 98. So I spent the longest time there and the most invested there. So um, that's when that's when that chapter started, the, the Colorado Springs chapter. Wow. Did you play any sports uh, up until high school? I played soccer. Um, obviously, growing up and being in Germany, that was a big part. Uh, so I played competitively. Then when I got to high school, I played varsity throughout my um, Were you kicking ass from playing in Germany and... Like, were you pretty good? I, I did come in pretty good. And yeah. it's in, not to, like, bolster thing, like, say, oh, freaking great dude. But I came in, you know, as a as a freshman, and, and I was holding my own on the team already. Like, I was already, yeah. like, pretty decent. So. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and so during your, your time in high school, did you, your dad, like, you, your, so your mom and dad got back together basically prior to that or, or when she moved? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say got back together. It was more of a co-parent type situation, um, you know, Whenever he left for deployments, because he was still active duty at the time, whenever he left to form for deployments, my mom would come in and, you know, she'd be there to take care of us. And then they'd kind of swap out when deployment was over. Yeah. Um, it was just kind of the way that went. Like, very rarely were they both there at the same time. Wow. Um, when, when you first uh, went back to Germany and linked up with him, was it awkward, weird? Did you harbor any animosity? Was it okay? How, how did that go? I never had any animosity. And... It wasn't until I had my own kids and I realized how much of an impact I have on their lives as as a father, as they're growing, that I wouldn't say I developed an animosity because I'm a lot closer with my dad than I used to be. Um, but I, I'm def there's definitely part of it where I'm like, man, I, I missed out. You know, yeah. not having a dad around, um, I definitely missed out. There's things that, you know, every boy wonders like, hey, what does it take to be a man? Like, and if you don't if you don't have a mentor, if you don't have somebody that's like teaching you, you're going to seek it on your own. And it's going to be through people in high school. It's going to be through their big brothers. Like you're going to find a male role model mm -hmm. and, you know, unless you have your own, like, and that can be good or it can be bad. You know, I, yeah. I think in a lot of ways in our society, it's really bad yeah. with the lack of father figures that are like teaching, teaching boys to be men, right. And what it means to be a man, you know? Yeah. So what was the, um, f the first thing that he did with you once you linked back up with him where you felt like, fuck, this is a, a father-son moment? We played paintball. Really? Yeah. And you um, smoked your ass, I'm assuming? Dude. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I hope. So we played, we started playing in Germany. Um, we bought like these, you know, at the PX, you can get these cheapo paintball guns. And he had some of his, um, some of his buddies there and we'd go play on post. And, um, that was like the first thing we really did together that were like really stuck. It's like, man, this is fun. Like this dude really knows what he's doing. And that carried on into, um, you know, when we moved back to the States, you know, we'd go play paintball and stuff as well. So yeah. 
Was there a uh, like an initial talk, like the the initial meeting of of not knowing him at all? What was that like? <clears throat> I feel like we really skipped that step. Like, like honestly, like it was like, hey, here we are. Here's your room. Here's how you get to school. Get a haircut. <laughs> check the watch bill. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I guess it. I don't know. I, I was just always super go with the flow, and like yeah. that was my new flow. And we just kind of went into it. And, you know, it wasn't just like, I hate you. You're not my real dad. You can't tell me what to do. You know, you've never yeah. been like it was never anything like that. It was yeah. just like I was there, and now I'm here, and we yeah. just kind of moved on. Um, that's that's uh, interesting and kind of surprising. I mean, and maybe it's just because it seems like there's such a almost a vitriol that way from kids now, where it's like, you know, like they all hate their fucking parents. And yeah. I mean, it's kind of always been that way, but it. I, I, you know, it just, it seems, um, surprising in a good way, you know, yeah. that you're just like, man, fuck whatever. I, like, and I think a lot of it was probably just the way that my mom had postured that relationship. You know, she was never, she never fed into the, he abandoned you or he's gone and you're with me and I do more than he does. It was like never any of that. Yeah. So when I got there, it wasn't, there was no animosity. It's just like, Hey, he's been doing his thing. Now he's ready for you to live with him. Yeah. You know, he's got more stable position right now. So it was just, yeah, it, yeah, it wasn't, there wasn't anything extra. There was no like crazy harbored emotions tied to yeah. it. Yeah. That's uh, that's really cool to hear. I mean, uh, props to your mom for, uh, for being that way, you know? Yeah. You look, <laughs> looking back, I was like, I was like, man, she, she really hooked it up. And like, yeah. thankfully, even though they got divorced and that part didn't work out, um, most women would not have handled it that way. I've seen some, I'm sure you have too, just seen some like wildly crazy divorce stories yeah. where it's just like, you get the kids for the weekend and all you do is like buy them all the toys they want, shit all over the other parent and then send them back and just yeah. like create this, crazy toxic situation no thank thankfully that that wasn't my situation you know yeah. so yeah well, that's good um <clears throat> did did you ask him or did he kind of fill you in on what he does for a living since it, i mean was, was there some of that a little bit um you know my my glimpse into the army was always skewed because i only knew it from the special operations side yeah like i barely ever saw my dad in uniform if I did, it was because it was pictures of him overseas with a beard or whatever. Um, you know, he'd take me to the team room and we'd hang out in there and it was like a, you know, pre-internet team room. So VHS tapes of varying uh, topics from triple X down to <laughs> like whatever, you know, it was a team room, you know, yeah. it was it was beer and movies and like, you know, just cool dudes. Uh, yeah. So that was like, that's what the army looked like to me. Yeah. I, I knew that wasn't like for everybody, but yeah. that's kind of what my expectation was. So, I mean, now where you're at, do you do you know, like, did he do some pretty cool shit operationally? Yeah, no shit. Yeah, really cool, really cool stuff. Um, so he, he has a very unique career as things were changing a lot. You know, he was he came in, um, he was like a crypto linguist, and then he was a 18 series. He was a communicator, and then it was a warrant an MI. And then that branch went away. So then he came back and ran the Sad A's as an eight, as a, uh, as a Zulu. So as, as a, um, uh, master sergeant again. So it's like, can you decipher that for the listener? <laughs> yeah. So, um, he was an enlisted guy and then he commissioned to be an officer in a branch that disappeared. So when that disappeared, he got the option to either get out or he could be an enlisted guy again. So he became an enlisted guy again. And then he ran the, um, Sad A's, which is like, you know, it's a little bit more on the sensitive side, what they do, but it's, um, it has a lot with communications and intercept and things like that. Yeah. So, um, he did that until he retired. Yeah. So he's retired as an E eight enlisted guy, but his retirement pay is as a W three because that's the uh -huh. highest rank he held for a certain amount before it went away. So yeah. a lot of weird stuff happened during his career where they yeah. were like creating and getting rid of new branches. Yeah. SF was developing a lot more. So what, uh, do you know the span of years he was in? He did 28 years active duty and then moved over and went to Sock North, um, which is on Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado. And he ran their uh, part of the operations cell for like another 19 years. And he Jesus. just he just double retired last year. So. Wow. so, I mean, you guys were on active duty at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, it, there was like he retired the year I entered service. Oh, okay. So, yeah. And then went, did the, and then he went over to Sock North. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So you're in high school. <clears throat> um, was, was there a, an element from him doing what he did 
from a motivation to serve? Like, was there a, a defining moment that you're like, you know what, I want to be a fucking Green Beret in high school? Or how, how did you decide that that's what you wanted to do? Um, I mean, there was definitely some influence there, but I, I think really my reason to join the military was I, I knew I wasn't ready for college. And I didn't really have any desire to go to college, except that I was told that that's what I'm supposed to do. Like, if you want to get ahead in life, you got to go to college or you're going to be flipping burgers. Coincidentally, I know a lot of people who flip burgers that have been to college. So, like, yeah. um, so no, it was more of a, I want to do something. I don't want to be stagnant. So I'm going to join the army until I figure out what I want to do. So I enlisted just, uh, just as an infantry guy, unassigned, airborne. Um, Cause I was if I'm going to join the army. I want to do something cool. I want to be, you know, a combat guy. And he didn't really push me towards SF at all. Um, you know, did he, was, he discourage it or did he, I mean, did he talk to you at all about it? No, honestly, his only, his only advice, he just said, don't be a leg. <laughs> yeah. So for the, at least jump out of fucking that, plane. That was his thing, you know, and he, and he started his career in the 82nd too. So he's yeah. been like, you know, he yeah. probably has like airborne wings, like embedded in him, yeah. you know, like, but, uh, and for those of you who don't understand leg is a semi derogatory term for those who don't jump out of airplanes in the military. So which stands for what? What's that? Lacking enough guts. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah, he just said, don't be a leg. So yeah. I signed up and I didn't be a leg. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. That's, fu that's wild. I mean, I like it, put trying to put myself in his shoes. It would be hard to have that little of input. Um, you know, I mean, like, obviously it was a totally different scenario. You, you know, he spent the first, you know, or I mean really more than half. I mean, most of your childhood not with you. So yeah. I guess maybe that was part of it, but yeah. I would just think like, <clears throat> even under those circumstances, if I had a son and at 13, he shows up and a few years later, he's like, yeah, I want to join the army. I'd be like, sit the fuck down. Let's talk about <laughs> yeah. it. Uh, you yeah. should join the Navy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I've thought about that as my, my oldest son is 14 now. And it's funny the other day, uh, we, we went, we just went through my, my grandma passed away recently and we've got a bunch of old pictures and things that, that I had sent her from my whole career. And there was a picture of me in Iraq when I was 18. Um, and I showed it to him. I was like, dude, this was me four years older than you are right now. How yeah. freaking wild is that? Yeah. Like, and it wasn't like a, Hey, you better get your shit together. But it was like, it was in my own realization. Like, God dang, I was young when I was yeah. in combat the first time. Yeah, I know. And, uh, now thinking that, man, he's just a couple of years from making that decision. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. being a father with that influence. Yeah. You yeah. Know. I mean, my, when I was my oldest child's age, right. As we sit here today, I was in, in boot camp. Yeah. You know, uh, which is fucking crazy. It's, it's nuts to think about. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, all right. So you join, uh, you go to Benning, um, regular infantry. Yep. How, how did, how was that comparative to how you thought it was going to be? I'd say it met expectations. Like yeah. I was hungry for it. And I don't know if you look back and you're just like, Oh, maybe it's this deep seated thing that like I needed authority or whatever. Because like, but I like really liked it. I was, I was into it. Did I was you get like, in trouble a lot in high school. Yeah, but not for like, not for really bad things. Like my, my trouble was skipping school. Um, and it's just always, I felt like I had better things to do. You know, I'd go out, I, you know, I had a truck and a driver's license, so I would leave school and I'd go four wheeling or do some other stuff like that. Like yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't ever for a good reason. You yeah. know, it was just going off and doing dumb shit. But, um, I was never like, I was like bad. I wasn't yeah. like law breaking bad. Yeah. Um, I just did other stuff, you yeah. know, barely graduated. So. Yeah. <laughs> you and me both. Yeah. Um, all right. So met expectations. You were hungry for it. Yeah. Um, what year did you join? 2003. So oh three. So basically Iraq kicks off and you go straight fucking there. Huh? Yeah. Tell yeah. Me, tell me about that experience. Yeah. So, um, when I joined, uh, I was told that I was going to go to Fort Polk to be with the 509th, which is they're the op four unit. So, you know, when units go down to train to Louisiana, you have guys who they train to be bad guys and you fight against them in the sim war. And you know, that that's how you get validated to, for your own unit to go, to go to combat. So I was part of that unit that, that was the bad guys. And I think what a lot of people don't understand about that unit is that they are very tactically proficient on U S army infantry skills as well as adversarial skills. So, um, it's actually like a really good unit to be in because you get to see what it's like being on both sides. So you understand it better. And yeah. I spent, shoot, I was only there a couple months before they said, Hey, you guys are going to support 10th mountain in Iraq. It was like a 30 day notice. Wow. Whereas like now, you know, well not now, but like when G was still on, it was like, you know, when you're going to deploy, you know, like two years out when your unit's going to be up, it was just like, Hey, yeah. 30 days, we're out of here. We're going to Iraq. Yeah. Oh, shit. I'm, All right. 
Yeah, you're the first person I've met that's been part of a, an official op for or opposition force unit. Uh, I'm curious, how much, um, from a training standpoint, adversarially, um, are they like scanning or, or, you know, like looking at footage of ambushes and things like that and trying to mimic it? Like how, how much training did you guys get as far as how to act that way? It was quite like, a bit. Yeah. Like yeah. How, how did they come up and develop with it? It was just counter to, you know, U S army infantry tactics. It was like, yeah. here's the vehicles they use. Here's what they're tackling. Here's battle drill two a, or here's how they react to contact. So we would just come up with ways to counter that. Like we were legitimately trying to fight them as best as we could, you know, knowing what their MO was. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. you know, people, I don't think a lot of people realize like how unscripted it is. Like they just let us go out there and wreak havoc. Oh, but sure. when we do it, there's a realism involved in it. Like we can't just say, okay, I would put an ID there. Boom. There's an ID in the road. Like we would go out with pickaxes with freaking full weight scenario, like one five, five rounds or whatever. And we actually had to tie a fake deck cord around it. And we had to have a demo expert come through and make sure that our like Yuli knot and everything was tied correct. Like we had to in place a no kidding real IED yeah. to be able to use it in that scenario. Same thing when we set up ambushes, it's like we didn't get away with just being able to like wave a magic wand and make something happen. We had to work for it, which yeah. was great because yeah. it's like, you know how hard it is to put a freaking IED in a hard packed dirt road, like it takes a long ass time, yeah. especially when you're trying not to get seen by freaking like helicopters and everything. So yeah, yeah like the, the actual op four job was taken very seriously. And because of that, like, like being on the other side of it and knowing what it, knowing what it's like to be hiding and watching a guy like scanning around on a Brad looking for you and stuff like that's like, yeah. Man, yeah. I mean, to me, that, that makes me think, um, I mean, to kind of dovetail onto your point is, is how invaluable that would be for all. Like, I think it would be really beneficial. I know, like, for us, we, we take turns and, you know, yeah. or we'll do squad on squad or, you know, whatever. So, like, we're playing the bad guy pretty regularly in, yeah. in mount scenarios or, or, you know, urban desert, me, whatever. So we get a taste of that. But I think military-wide, especially conventional forces, because they're out there frankly in the middle of that type of stuff way more than even special operations are really yeah uh where they're just kind of sitting fucking ducks or walking ducks and, and they get ambushed or whatever where that would be w wildly beneficial yeah for them to see it from the other side and know what what they look like as they're as they're doing things yeah be, being the adversary i think in like in a lot of aspects not just military but like being able to put yourself in a position where you're fighting yourself, yeah. you know, it's just going to expose weaknesses. It's going to like put you in that other foot. I mean, yeah. even to the point to where like, you know, humorlessly, I don't know how many guys have been to like Iraq, Afghanistan or, or wherever. And talking to villagers be like, Hey, uh, we're looking for this guy. They're like, I don't know that guy. Okay. I'm sure you don't. Yeah. It was the same situation for us. Like we would have one of our guys, usually like a squad leader or a platoon leader or whatever, who was like, Hey, this guy's the VIP. He lives in this village. Like they're going to be looking for him. And we do the same crap. Be like, yeah, yeah I've never heard of him. You know, like, so yeah. you're literally doing the exact same stuff. So yeah. like when it happened in real, we were just like, huh? Okay. Yeah. Man, so. That's wild. All right, guys, as you know, I'm into uh, health and fitness uh, and specifically how nutrition relates to it. Um, coffee has, has been a staple of mine and, and I think most people's for a long time. Um, as you know, I'm a big uh, proponent of Mudwater, which is a sponsor of this show. They have been uh, for a while now, and, and we have a great partnership. I love their product. Um, it's a phenomenal alternative to coffee. Uh, for me, you know, coffee, there's jitters, there's mold in it. Uh, you know, a lot of times it tends to, to kind of upset my stomach. Uh, but Mudwater has adaptogenic uh, mushrooms. Um, there's a fraction of of the caffeine that coffee has. There's a little bit, but it's very, very little. Um, and it, it really leans on, on mushrooms and the blend of matcha and chai for kind of that sustained energy that, that continues to go and, and doesn't crash the way coffee does when, uh, when it runs out. Uh, they use lion's mane for alertness, cordyceps to support physical performance, chaga and raishi to support the immune system, turmeric for soreness and cinnamon for antioxidants. Um, I, I really enjoy that first cup of warm liquid in the morning by taking mud water instead of coffee. And I'll put uh, just a splash of, of heavy cream uh, or even some protein powder, uh, some collagen powder. Um, and I'll also throw uh, usually a couple drops of uh, stevia or uh, monk fruit vanilla to make it kind of a, a thick, 
normal morning coffee ritual type of uh, concoction. And uh, I got to tell you, it, it, it does wonders for me. And, and I'm really, really glad that I switched. It's been, you know, a better part of a year now, uh, you know, that I've been taking that uh, and using that as part of my uh, daily morning routine. And it's fantastic. I love it. I, I can't re- recommend it enough. Uh, it's 100% USDA, uh, organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher certified. Uh, and they also donate to the Berkeley Center for Science of Psychedelics, which is, uh, you know, groundbreaking and leading research to help veterans with PTSD uh, and other uh, associated illnesses and, and uh, syndromes. So uh, great cause, great company, phenomenal product. If you go to Mudwater, that's M-U-D-W-T-R dot com forward slash Mike to su- support this show and the product uh, and use the code Mike Mud. M-I-K-E-M-U-D, all caps, for 15% off. That's, again, mudwater, M-U-D-W-T-R dot com forward slash Mike. And the code is Mike Mud, M-I-K-E-M-U-D, all caps, for 15% off. Go check them out. Yeah. Did you find yourself later on in your career as a, as a special operator thinking back to those moments and drawing from your time as an Op 4 guy? Always. Oh, yeah. shit. Yeah, I don't think that has ever left. Maybe not necessarily the, the exact like counter tactics and things that we did, but just putting myself in that mindset. And whenever, you know, as we start getting to more mission planning and things like that, actually being able to jump forward into our plan, putting ourselves in position to fight our own plan and saying, all right, if I was a bad guy and I was here when my plan executed, what would I do? How would I feel? How would I, what would suppress me and keep me from being able to attack? Yeah. You know, so I carried that mindset throughout the rest of my career just to counter my own plans. Sure. Um, so, yeah, that's like I said, it just uh, kind of light, light bulb moment wise, like how massively beneficial that would be for, for all guys to spend some time doing that. Yeah. You know, I think, I think a lot of guys, you know, hate hearing that they have to go to NTC or JRTC because it's generally for the, for the training unit, kind of a miserable experience. You know, yep. you get beat up and then they come tell you how fucked up you are. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but but in reality, there is a lot of value in it if executed properly. And yeah, yeah like if you can do some force on force, but not just like blue on blue tactics, yeah. but it can be legitimately like, hey, I want you to think like a bad guy and be a bad guy. Yeah. Super awesome, realistic training opportunity. You yeah. don't have to be off for to do it. You can set yeah. like teams can do their own training. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, all right. So they gave you a 30 day notice. Yeah. Uh, now, you know, you're going to Iraq. What was boots on the ground when you first showed up there? Like, yeah. So um, we landed in. Uh, Camp Buring, Kuwait, which was, I think a lot of people spent time there. And at that time we still weren't flying into country. So the way that they would, the way that they would get all these support units and all that stuff up to Baghdad or whatever is whenever an infantry unit would, would uh, rip into country, you would be their escort into country. So, you know, you fly into Kuwait and then you're going to drive with a convoy all the way up to Baghdad to deliver them. And then you're going to go to wherever you're going to get stationed to. So, um, you know, spent, spent, I don't know, I can't remember, it wasn't that long, a couple of weeks, doing some pre-deployment training in Kuwait. And then they get our vehicles and our gigantic convoy of support vehicles. And I'm like, all right, guys, take these dudes to Baghdad. And as we did, and crossed the border and drove all the way into Baghdad. Um, so that was like, that was the first experience. And jumping back, I always like tell the story because I think it's super humorous, especially if you know like young lieutenants who are super optimistic about the world and they think it'll change everything. Um, I was an RTO. Uh, at the time, I just, I don't know, I guess I had a good connection with the PL and, you know, I was fairly competent on the radio. So, uh, I'm riding in his truck and he's like, he's going to change the world big time. And we're seeing all these families on the side of the road. And, uh, you know, like people were like asking for money or asking for water or whatever. And he's like, I'm going to throw these, these next group of people, I'm going to throw a water bottle to them, you know, that just to, <laughs> just to help them out, just to show them that America's here, you know? Yeah, so I'm yeah. like, all right, that's going to, that's going to make the difference. All right, dude. And for those who have been deployed and seen like the water bottles you get when you're overseas, they're not 12 ounce water bottles. They're like a liter and a half. They're yeah. big. Yeah. Um, so he takes this thing out and as we're driving down the road, he sees his family. He's like, all right, I'm going to throw this to them. <laughs> He chucks this thing out the window and like explodes at their feet, just like <laughs> splashes of water all over him. And like, he just looked back forward in silence, didn't say a word. And like, it was the funniest thing. It was like, America's here, bitches. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you're welcome for my yeah. service. It was so funny. Um, oh, it's yeah. fucking classic. You know, and he, he was successful. He was a good dude and yeah. heart, his heart was in the right place, but it was just so funny. Like, that's awesome. Like, 
Good job, buddy. Yeah, like, <laughs> great work. I'm, I'm sure there's a metaphor there for like us meddling around over there. Yeah, like, for sure. Hey, hey, country, here's our service. Yeah. You're welcome. Shove you it know? down your throat. <laughs> Fucking soak you with it. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's wild. Um, anything on that deployment that stood out as uh, super close calls? I mean, did you get into some, some airy shit? Yeah. Um, I went most of my deployment fairly unscathed, which was wild. Like guys left and right were getting ticked up like near ambush all the time. Like we spent a lot of time in like Atomia and freaking like Sodder City. Like we were in the places where guys get freaking messed up. You know, our um, our PDSS, you know, our, our pre-deployment guys who went there to you know, to get us ready to deploy, like three of those guys came back with freaking like purple hearts. Like wow. our BC got, you know, hit with an RPG, like on his first ride out and freaking went home with a CIB and a, and a purple heart, like two weeks into country. So it was like, but my platoon specifically, man, it's just like, it barely ever happened. And if it did, it was like pop shots here and there. And we were like patrolling almost every day until just about probably like two months out from, from the, uh, from our deployment being over. And I remember specifically, so I was in, I was in the first truck. Uh, I was up on the 50 and we were on a four truck convoy. We were just doing patrols and we were, we would, we would generally do them. I don't know, usually around 11 at night until about six in the morning, just driving around looking for a fight, really just you patrolling the streets, keeping people from put IDs in whatever. So I remember the sun had just come up we're cruising down the street and I'll always remember, um, so, you know, the song from Journey, Carry On My Wayward Son, whatever. So, you know, this is going to date myself as well, but we had, you know, we all had CD players, and I had my little speakers up in the turret, and I remember that song had come on, and it was like the whole very beginning part, you know, Carry On My Wayward Son, and then right, as we got, um, uh, right when the music is about to hit off, it was like this whole ambush kicked off. So, like, whenever wow. I hear that song, as soon as, like, the beat drops... Yeah, that's when it was. It was like, you know, I'm looking forward. Obviously, I'm the front gun, and I just start hearing boom, boom. So I turn around and look. Um, first thing I see is like an RPG skip off the road right in front of the Humvee behind me. Um, and then I start seeing green tracers come in like in a big way from like, and the buildings are real close together too. Like no kidding, like near ambush. Um, and then the other trucks are like completely pinned down. Thanks for like my truck. We were just outside the ambush zone, so I was able to engage. Um, but it was just like, I, w I had the, the least amount of training you could possibly have and having never had combat experience. Like, I just think about how ineffective I was because you're just reacting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my brain, I was like, all right, the 50 needs to stay oriented towards the front. You know, that could be our most casually producing weapon. And if something comes from there, I want to do that. But I also want to engage because my other guys can't. So I, I turned around with my M4 um, started engaging and like, it just all felt like slow motion, it, it, like super weird, but not like in the zone, slow motion. Like I was just blasting towards where the fire was coming from. Could you see any of the guys that were shooting at you? Yeah. There was one guy who, I don't even know what he was doing or why, but like he like ran out on the road and like ran back. I, I can't even remember what he was doing, but like, that was the only guy from that side of it I saw. Um, and then on the other side, like all of a sudden I start seeing green tracers come down from a rooftop, um, coming down towards our convoy from the other side. Um, and those were, those are the first two guys in my life and career that I've aimed at engaged and like, you know, with an attempt to destroy, like I am trying to kill people right now. Um, which was super, super weird at that time. Again, like, like it, it's so hard to explain that everything felt slow. And all of a sudden I realized like, dude, I'm down, like I only have one magazine left. It just all happened fast. And it was like, as quickly as it started, it was just gone. Yeah. We're like, everyone was fine. Minimal damage to the vehicles. Um, yeah, just super chaotic. And I think now looking back at it, after I've been in subsequent engages and thinking about my mindset and my clarity and my ability to actually do work, just, just goes to show the difference between like being trained and ready as opposed to just like being thrown into the mix and just how you react differently, yeah. you know, cause I've never felt that way again. Like I've never, I've never felt like I wasn't in the zone. I never felt like everything was so chaotic that it was slow. Like any of my engagements in my career since then, I've never felt like that. But that like very first one was just so weird. It, like almost feels like a dream sometimes. Yeah. That's wild. Do you know if yeah. you, if you guys engaged and, and got any of them? Um, no, like by the time we went back, like there, there was a lot of blood and a lot of ammo. Like I think they policed up their dead, um, yeah. or wounded, whatever they were. 
Um, you know, the guys that I engaged up on the roof, um, those guys dropped. I don't know if I killed them. I don't know if, if I wounded them. I don't know if I just scared the shit out of them. Like, um, I just know that I shot at them and the engagement from that side that stopped. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like, wow. I don't know. Yeah, that's um, wild. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's hard to imagine, uh, you know, we, cause I, I went in at 18 also, um, but, you know, just th thinking of, of being put in that environment because I went right into the SEAL team, so it, it was several years before I deployed. But, you know, kind of like to your point, it, you know, just putting kids, yeah. you know, with very, very little training into those types of environments yeah. uh, is fucking dicey, you know. Well, we, had, we had an ever-evolving ROE, um, rules of engagement, and there was one that we had for a short while, which was so it's so incredible to even think that that was a thing, but it was like the, the death blossom was legitimately like, if you get hit with an ID, everyone will shoot in any direction that could possibly hide somebody. Yeah. That didn't last very long because yeah. <laughs> you can see why that wouldn't be a good idea. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> you're going to circle make, ambush. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're going to make a lot more enemies than, yeah. than possible just by wow. like shooting at anything that moves after you get hit with an ID. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. Um, was it, did that was that the extent of that deployment for for yeah for like big contacts it was um we had we had another ied strike on that trip as well um thankfully it was it wasn't close enough to kill anybody just not to like kind of rock us it was big boom but just poor timing on the detonator on on him for yeah. for, for not hitting us but uh that was that was really it like i said occasional pop shots things like that yeah. um but that was the biggest one, yeah. fairly unscathed. Yeah, yeah. So you come home from that. Um, was the subsequent deployment again to Iraq with regular infantry, or no? So that was my only conventional deployment. Yeah. So um, I got back, and I had my ambitions. I was like, all right, well, I want to go. Um, I want to go SF. I've now determined that's what I want to do. But first, I want to go to Ranger School. I want to do the whole thing. Like I wanted to be Airborne Ranger. I wanted to spend some time in our, our recon platoon. And then eventually, like SF for me was always, a, eventually I want to yeah. go there. It wasn't ever the first thing I wanted to do. Um, but uh, I got moved to the recon platoon, um, which I really loved. Like it was, you know, really cool. It was all, you know, sniper stuff. And uh, I had a date to go to ranger school. And then the army had different plans for me. Um, they had started this thing called the corporate recruiting program where they wanted to get guys that were young that had already been to combat and they wanted to get them back out into the recruiting force. So I got, well, that's a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not for like a young motivated dude yeah. who just wants to be a, like yeah. a super soldier. Like again, like when I say I was like the best little robot, I was like, yeah. I loved it. I loved being told what to do. Like I loved being freaking like the best soldier. I loved being a rifleman just straight yeah. up tell me where to go, tell me what to dig, tell me what to shoot. I was just like super enthralled by it. Like, um, but no, I got pulled into corporate recruiting and they said, Hey, uh, that's great that you've got those plans, but recruiting takes precedence over everything, which it does, you know, even like SF recruiting, like if you have a packet to go to selection, but you're going to be a recruiter, like you're going to be a recruiter. Yeah. So, uh, so that's what happened. Um, I got pulled to go be a recruiter. And I spent two years in Colorado Springs trying to put people in the army. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was that fucking just miserable? I hated it. Yeah. Yeah. It uh, was terrible. Cause it was, it was funny because like now, like I work in, I work in sales and sales was part of what I do, but like that was almost like, it was telemarketing Yeah. and I already didn't want to be there. And everybody who worked there with me was like career recruiter who hadn't deployed. Yeah. So I already had this thing, like they were all a bunch of pogues and like nobody knew anything about combat and. I was not a very good recruiter. Yeah. I, I put in bare minimum and I only put people in that like I would have been happy to serve with. Yeah. So your um, numbers were pretty low. Real low. <laughs> I did. So, you know, the, the quota or I guess the standard is like two a month, um, which I got that exactly, you know, over my, over my two years that I did that job, um, I had 24. Um, actually I wouldn't be too much. Yeah. I guess I was behind on that. <laughs> yeah. I put like 24 people in. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. super great. Yeah. Um, but again, like I didn't put anybody in that I wouldn't have wanted to serve with. Yeah. Um, I think there should be more of that. Uh, but, uh, sorry. Right, so you do that. And then where did you yeah. go from there? So from there I was like, well, I, I've already wasted more time than I want to. So I'm just going to go, um, straight to SF at this point. So I went to selection 
uh, from being a recruiter, got selected. And then when my recruiting time was done, thankfully the corporate recruiting program was only a two year gig, normally recruiting is three years. So um, after those two years, uh, I PCS straight to brag uh, to start the Q course. And what was that like uh, expectation versus reality? Um, I guess I didn't really, really know what to expect. Um, you know, I still had the, I still had the infantry mindset, you know, I was still a hard worker. I was still going to push myself. So, um, it, but it was one of the first times I'd really interacted with a lot of people outside of recruiting that weren't combat arms, yeah. just seeing a bunch of people from different, you know, from different places. And what's unique about special forces, especially with the 18 X program, when they bring guys in right off the street is you have people coming in with such unique backgrounds like there's guys with master's degrees or there's guys that like hey I, I was a ceo for this company or hey i did like it's a lot of really intriguing people or hey i've been a mechanic all my life or i drove trucks coming in to all do the same thing whereas in my world it's like yeah everybody's everybody's an infantry guy you know a lot of guys are rangers or you know ranger tab anyway i was never in the battalions um but it's like so to like work with people who had a bunch of different backgrounds like it was yeah. it was awesome yeah before you went, uh, or early on, did you ever consult or talk with your dad about what to expect or anything like that? You know, he, he was glad that I was doing it, but he gave me the same advice, which is like the same thing I tell everybody now too, which is why it makes sense why he does. It's just, Hey, just don't, don't quit. Yeah. You know, like you will learn the skills you need to learn and you know, you can be developed and built into what you need to be as a team guy. But what we can't do is instill a no quit attitude into you. You have to bring that yourself. Yeah. You have to determine that. So, you know, now it's the same thing. I tell people we're like, Hey man, I'm really thinking about doing this. I'm like, great man, just don't quit. Yeah. You know, if you don't quit, you're already like leaps and bounds above, you know, a lot of the guys who are going to get booted out, you yeah. know, and, and you can see that, you know, the difference between guys that quit and guys that don't, and that's what we need yeah. the guys that don't quit. So, yeah. um, yeah, that was really what he gave me. But yeah. now looking back, that's all I really give anybody else too. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I, I mean, to me, there's, I, I think that, that that's for a reason or by design that most guys' advice to young up-and-coming fill-in-the-blank special operations candidates is that, you know, because to me there's a correlation between the type of guy that, that A, is wanted slash desired, and B, that, that is the type of guy that, that's going to make it through that isn't a guy that that uh, that should need extensive advice on how to make it yeah you know because yeah. like if, if you're i mean like the, the recruiting for special oper or for uh, special warfare in the navy anyway like there's a percentage like they've done you know multiple studies on it and, and even kids that say hey i want to be a seal like when they show up to the seal recruiters the disparity between the ones who when they show up have already put themselves through the test mm -hmm. have already know what the standards are and, and know that they can meet them because they like the self starters that show up and be like, Hey, I've already done all this. I know yeah. what I need to do versus everybody else. It's like 99% of the people, like if they haven't done those things before they're told to do them, they, they yeah. have no chance of making it. Yeah. Like if, <clears throat> if you, if you showed up just having not prepared or not saying, yeah. Hey, I know, I know I'm going to carry a ruck. Yeah. So I better start putting a ruck on a lot, you know, I know I'm going to land nav, so I better freaking get up on my land nav. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you, if you don't do that, like, again, you've, you've kind of already self-selected, but yeah. you know, how much advice can you really give a guy that's going like, Hey, when you're land naving, make sure you do this or even, yeah. you know, in your sake, Hey, make sure that, you know, when you're swimming, you're doing yeah. this. It's like, no, no advice is really going to help. Yeah. Except don't quit. Like, yeah. this. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I mean, but to me, like, you know, people all the time, like, Hey, I want to be a seal. What should I do? It's like, you're already not the right guy. You know, it's like, <laughs> If yeah. you're asking me what you should do to prepare, you're already not the right fucking yeah. guy, you know. Yeah. Um, you should listen 10 times as much as you speak. Yeah, but I mean, with, with the amount of information that's out there now, it's like you have zero excuse to ask any fucking questions, yeah. really about anything almost at this point. Yeah. But there's guys that do, there's guys that are doing like, um, like guys who've gotten out and they're doing like, hey, uh, join my program mm -hmm. and I'll show you the, I'll, I'll help civilians train up so yeah. that when you when you go in your contract, you can do that. There's guys who do it yeah. um, for SF, and I'm sure there's guys who do it for oh, SEALs yeah. too. Yeah, know. there's a bunch. Um, all right, so you go through a Q course. Um, as you went through it and, and got into the unit, what was that like? Um, so I had to, I definitely had to break out of my like robot my mentality and. Uh, Again, having grown up in the infantry, so I was a I was an E six um, staff sergeant when I got to group. Mm. So um, 
I got there and it was, I wouldn't say it was more relaxed than I expected, but like still, you know, one of the things in the army and maybe the Navy too is like you show up as disciplined as you're supposed to. And then you let somebody else tell you to relax. Yeah. You know, you don't want to show up sloppy and be like, dude, why the fuck? Why aren't you at parade rest? Why aren't you whatever? You know, um, so the SEAL teams are kind of the opposite. Yeah. So I'm going to assume it's the most <laughs> relaxed grooming standards until you tell me I'm fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and maybe maybe it has morphed that way or maybe the, yeah. the new generation is just like, hey, man, I'm supposed to show up with my hands in my pockets and like yeah. I wear my freaking sunglasses all the time. And like, I don't know, maybe that's the case, but that wasn't me yeah. uh, again. Like talk about how much I enjoy just like I enjoyed being like the best at what I was told to be. So when I showed up and I was like, all right, hey, I want to be uh, I'm, I'm here to report. They're like, all right, great. You're going to go to a mountain team. You were in Colorado, so you should be a mountain guy. Have you ever climbed anything before? I was like, trees maybe i don't know like i'm a kid i was a boy i've climbed stuff like yeah. <laughs> so like all right well you're from colorado and there's you're in. they're like you're you're from colorado and there's mountains in colorado so you're going to be on a mountain team I was yeah. like, that's cool i didn't even know mountain teams existed <laughs> most people don't you know um so they tell me which team room to go to they're like all right hey go down to this team room down here um so i'm in uniform i walk down the hall get to the door like all right here we go this is my introduction to my team you know my my new family uh, I knock on the door three times. I announce my presence, you know, uh, I, I'm expecting them to say enter. Like for some reason in my mind, it was supposed to be like that. Uh, they open the door. And I remember I even like kind of like stuttered when I said it to you cause I was so nervous. Um, but I was like, I'm staff Sergeant Ray. I'm uh, reporting for duty. <laughs> These dudes were like, <laughs> like what the dude, fuck did you they, just say? Yeah. They looked at me like I was a fucking alien. <laughs> they were like, they were all sitting on the couch, like watching TV or just bullshitting, just like yeah. non-training team room activity, you know? Um, and it was funny as I remember the buddy of mine who I went through the Q course with who had gotten there just a little bit before me, he was looking up at the couch at me like, Oh my gosh, you just fucked up, dude. Yeah. Like, who are you? I was yeah. like, I saw the look in his eye and I was like, Oh no, uh, that was the wrong team room. Oh, no shit. Yeah. So <laughs> I got I got some bad intel. I went to the wrong team room and embarrassed myself. Um, I was like, I'm supposed to go to the mountain team. They were like, it's on the other side of the hall, jackass. <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. <laughs> so like, shut the door, turn around, and uh, do the exact same thing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so um, yeah, this one was a little bit more relaxed. Uh, guy opened the door, sent me up to the team sergeant and, and captain, so I introduced myself and all that stuff. Uh, and that was the beginning. And that's where it was like, all right, hey, you, you can relax a little bit in here, man. And, uh, you know, I, now I definitely got to the point now to where it's like, I shy away from like super strict discipline army stuff. And I've completely been like, yeah, that's yeah. now that's my life. So. Deinstitutionalized. Yeah, I have deinstitutionalized. Yeah. I know when to put it on when I have to, yeah. you know, because in the end, like you have to work with conventional guys or you yeah. have to work, you know, with department of state or whatever. So you, you have to know when to like turn the cool yeah. guy off. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Read the room. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But yeah, I'm now more comfortable as a cool guy. So yeah. <laughs> it awesome. took a while. Yeah. I want to take a second to talk about something near and dear to my heart, and that is a staunch supporter of this podcast, which is Bub's Naturals. Uh, the hat sitting in front of me uh, here on our coffee table here in the studio belonged to Glenn Doherty. His nickname was Bub. Uh, I did two platoons with him, and his childhood best friend uh, and another colleague of theirs, uh, Sean is the best friend, TJ is their colleague, uh, started Bub's Naturals, which is a collagen and MCT oil company uh, in Bub's or Glenn's honor. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's uh, an absolute honor to be sponsored by and working with a company that, um, you know, was started in the honor of one of my closest friends and, and a guy that I went to war with. And, uh, you know, the, the Bub's brand is not only super quality, um, you know, collagen, uh, collagen powder as well as MCT oil powder, um, you know, but they also give back to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Uh, they donate proceeds from their product sales to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, which, uh, you know, to me just furthers, uh, you know, the, the mission set on Veterans Day. They give 100% back. So uh, I do believe it's the best collagen on the planet. Uh, I like to mix it in with uh, morning coffee. The MCT oil powder, the same thing. Uh, mixes in very easy. It tastes great. Uh, and it just kind of adds everything that you want to start your day off from a brain health standpoint from uh, joint support, gut support, um, you know, MCT oil and collagen are, are two components, especially as, as we age, uh, that are integral components to, uh, to health. And so, uh, to be able to work with Bub's Naturals and, uh, be able to, to work with them and, and sponsor a product that, 
uh, number one is a high quality product. And number two is, is so near and dear to, uh, you know, to my heart and to the mic drop podcast for, for who it, uh, was started for and what it stands for. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it's an amazing, amazing place to be. So, um, it is whole 30 approved. Um, it's, uh, sport certified. So you're not uh, going to run into any problems with that. Um, and I will say that, um, you know, right now they're, they're offering, uh, 20%, <clears throat> 20% off if you go to bubsnaturals.com and, uh, use the mic drop code. So, uh, I really highly encourage you to, to try it out incorporated into your day day to day for joint health, for brain health, uh, for cognition, for gut health, and, uh, and to support an amazing organization that does a lot of things, uh, in Glenn Bubbs honor. So, uh, go to bubsnaturals.com. Mic drop is the code 20% off. So you jumped right into the mountain unit. When, when did you first deploy, uh, with them? How, how long was it from the time you checked in until you deployed? So it was within the first year. And because Afghanistan was so busy and basically everybody had a piece of it, third group, normally Africa is normally their, one of their areas of responsibility, but 10th group had picked it up at the time, which was honestly looking back, I loved it because I, I love the Africa trips. But, um, no, I went to, um, Mali within a couple months of getting to the team. Um, super operationally awesome. or training. No, it was a, it was a training event. So it was okay. a, it was a J set. Yeah. Um, and it was like, it was so austere, you know, it was the first time that a team had been there since like one of the many coups that this country has had. Um, so we were just living out in the middle of nowhere and, and just making it happen, working with guys that, you know, would consistently get their ass kicked by fricking whatever insert terrorist organizations in the area at this time. Yeah. And, um, super rewarding. Like, man, I loved it. Like, like you get to see hope, you know, you get to, you get to look at guys who are underfunded, you know, corruption is rampant you know, all the money we send over there, like only some of it makes it to those guys. Um, but they've got ammo, you're giving them weapons and you're actually teaching them tactics. And it's like, almost like for the first time, they're like, dude, we could survive a fight. Like yeah. we could actually win a fight. And it's true. They actually could. Yeah. Um, so you know, like really rewarding and super enjoyable experience, like working with guys that are legitimately about to go use it. Whereas like, I think a lot of the European J sets where you're working with like a near peer, yeah. you know, yeah, you're exchanging training and they're getting stuff out of it and you're getting stuff out of it. But like working truly with like a country that's fighting for yeah. their sovereignty against like a, a extremist organization, like yeah. it's really rewarding. And, yeah. you know, um, yeah, yeah, we did that with the Philippines um, when they were battling out with Abu Sayyaf down in the south. And yeah, uh, yeah I agree. It was it was it was very different. Yeah. You know, um, it just seemed so much more real. But. Um, so you go to Mali, you come back, yep. Afghanistan was your first deployment as a Green Beret? No, so we went to Iraq okay. after that one. So and This was what, like 05, 06? That, was in, that one was in 2010. Oh, no shit. Yeah, sure. so very close to when we have kind of officially pulled out yeah. of, um, of Iraq. And what's funny is I remember being there uh, when they had announced that all combat operations had stopped in Iraq, which was funny. You know, like yeah. I've now been in two countries where I've been told that combat operations have stopped and then you're the combat operations. So yeah. <laughs> like what that really means for those who want to know on the inside yeah. is that now all of your conventional support is gone and yeah. it's just you guys. Yeah. So like all the convoys that would normally be out sweeping for IEDs, all the freaking like patrols that constantly go out just to keep things busy yeah. to make your operation cleaner like that, that just goes away. And now yeah. it's just like, now it's just you guys doing it. So, yeah. um, went to Iraq, very non kinetic for us. Um, but I think it's because we were far enough in the war and people knew who we were, that they knew it wasn't worth engaging. You know, like they can get away with throwing grenades and, and ambushing the regular army guys um, because they were just gonna huddle up in their in their big MRAPs and like, they were just gonna take it and then they were gonna drive off. And it was like hardly worth it. Whereas like, we were still like, preferably we were still rolling around in Humvees with mini guns and like, they knew that we were hunting and yeah. we were there for a fight. So <clears throat> like, there was no outcome besides death if they engaged us. And yeah. that's a big reason why, like, man, we did, geez, like countless numbers of raids where we would find the guy, we would find the device, we would find the cash. But, you know, once we found it, they'd be like, yep, you got me, you yeah. know? They wouldn't fight at all. Yeah, because yeah. we're gonna put them in jail, you know, because we have a partner force with us. And speaking now about SF is like, we almost always ran with partner force. Very rarely was it unilateral. So it's like, not like you can just get away with like making things happen. It's like, no, like, there's a legal system. There's yeah. a warrant. You have to get a warrant, you know? Oh. So, um, yeah, like 
Did any of the raids that you went on at that time surprise you with what you found on them? Like, were there any things that you were like, holy shit, why the fuck is this here? Not, not on that trip. Um, I think a lot of it was more like you find out the connections later. Yeah. It was like, wait a minute, this guy's brother is in our unit. Or like, this guy's like, yeah. you just start seeing all this wild stuff. It's like, hey, this guy's just, like, he knows he's not going to get arrested for long because his cousin actually works in the city council or whatever. It was just a lot of those connections. And you start seeing a lot of that corruption and stuff. Just um, like here in America. Just crazy stuff. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. So that deployment, uh, successful, but, but fairly uneventful as far as. Yeah. Successful, yeah. uneventful, you know, definitely you know, learned a lot working with our partners, stuff that I carried on through my career. Um, but yeah, as far as like kinetic and gunfighting goes, yeah, it wasn't much that trip. Yeah. yeah. Nobody so, wanted it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you come home, uh, home for a, a period of time. Then, then where after that? Yeah. So um, after that, we had I had one more trip with that team. That would be my last enlisted trip, uh, where we went to Niger. This one was a little bit different, and I'll I'll kind of like pull back on the sensitivity on it. It was semi training, but also operational. Mm -hmm. So we were uh, in the northern part of the country. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on between, you know, Libya, Algeria, Mali had, you know, unfortunately had another like takeover. Uh, so weapons and stuff were flowing across through the desert. And we were in that area um, working with their military and then doing some other stuff as well. Um, and that was like legitimately middle of the nowhere deployment. Um, like I remember when we did our briefing, especially what's funny is comparing it to Afghanistan and like what their requirements are for like medical facilities, the timeline for us to get to a level of care was like 36 hours like if a guy got hurt where we were at that's how long it would take to get him somewhere wow. because we were so isolated Man. there was one tiny airstrip you could only use like little like casa 212s or dorniers or whatever which would have to fly you somewhere else to the capital to get you on a c-17 it was like you know basically don't get fucking hurt it was like don't get hurt yeah, yeah because if you do it's up to you yeah but you know those are also the best deployments like when, when you're in the middle of nowhere, nobody comes up to visit you. Nobody freaking like, you just do your job and you're like living in the desert amongst the, amongst the dudes and like yeah. just a good time, you know, working out in garage gyms and shooting whenever you want. Like, you know, awesome wild experience. West. Yeah, wild yeah. west stuff, yeah. Was there uh, operationally some decent shit that happened? No, nah, not for really. us on that. Like yeah. very, very valuable stuff and a lot of stuff that we enabled and a lot of stuff that we um, like, Follow on stuff based off of what we provided did well, but as far as yeah. us, like it wasn't a kinetic trip for us either. Yeah. Is, yeah. is uh, the the behind the scenes things that you guys made happen? Can you share any of that? Um, yeah, not really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I, I would just say in general, you know, there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes when you go somewhere. You're not just training your guys; you're also yeah. looking for things and providing answers to questions we might have about the area or identifying routes that might be used for things. And then, you know, there's, there's other people's or other organizations who you can use that information, you know, to, to make, yeah. you know, do either something kinetic or to shut something down. So yeah, it's just like, it's one of those things that's, it's boring because you're not the one in the fight for that, but well, like important. high, high payoff yeah. type stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, a lot of good stuff coming out of that one, but yeah. it wasn't us pulling the triggers. Yeah. I gotcha. Yeah. Um, so you come home after that deployment, um, about how, how much time is, is transpiring between deployments while you're home? Is it pretty quick turnarounds or usually about, it was about a year to 18 months at most. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you're married at this time. Yep. Yeah. How did, uh, let's yeah. take a couple of steps back. At, at what point did you get married or, you know, when, how did that yeah, so, fit into your yeah. military <laughs> career? So the, uh, um, the only benefit that came out of my recruiting time was that that's where I met my wife. Oh, okay. She was not a high school student. So yeah. that's, don't, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't yeah. meet her actively recruiting. Yeah. Um, so, I got a great career opportunity for you. Yeah, sweetheart. Tell you what, you'd actually be really bad for the military. So I'm going to disqualify you right now. No. Um, so no, I, I, I met my wife when I was recruiting and um, we kind of hit that road to where it was like, I was, I had passed selection, but I didn't know if I was going to pass the Q course, I mean, I knew I had to go there, but I had reenlisted and basically, and they basically said, Hey, you're going to go to Alaska. If you don't, if the Q course doesn't work out, whatever, you're going to go to Alaska. And That's it was pretty good motivation. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I was excited to go to Alaska yeah. at first because they just moved an infantry or uh, an airborne unit there. Oh, I was okay. like, Oh, I can still be a paratrooper 
in Alaska, that sounds fun. I like the I like the wilderness and stuff. Yeah. Uh, but my orders had me going to like the striker battalion. Oh yeah. So I was like, hey, uh, there must be a mistake here. I'm an airborne guy. I should go to the airborne unit. They're like, no, 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 it's not a mistake. Uh, you're an airborne guy who's going to the striker unit. And I was oh. like, nope, that's yeah. not me. So more motivation to yeah. to pass the course. Uh, so me and my wife were like, hey, we've been dating for about nine months now, and um, if you're going to be on my orders, we need to get married. Yeah. So let's fast forward things a little bit. And we did. Um, she was cool with that, huh? Yeah, I wouldn't say it was transactional, but it was just like, hey, things are going well already. We're already kind of living together, so let's just take this leap. Let's let's take this as a sign that let's just decide if this is it or not. Yeah. And uh, and it was it. So, yeah. So we got married, and she's been supporting this the whole time. <clears throat> Any pushback from her parents? No, nah, they were they love super you, supportive. Yeah, yeah I went cool. in and asked her asked their permission and everything. And, yeah. Um, you know, her dad's retired Air Force guy. Oh, nice. So, hence um, the Colorado Springs. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, all right. So, back to, you know, you're, you're married throughout this time. You're home yeah. for a year, year and a half. W- was it a typical strain that is put on most marriages? I mean, were, were there tough parts for you guys where being gone that much? And yeah, obviously, sure. at this point, you're having kids already because if, you, yeah. if you've got a 14 year old. Yeah. We made kind of a, kind of a weird decision, I guess. Um, is when I was in the Q course, we we're like, let's let's have a kid now, because this is the best opportunity for me to be there for some things, at least for one kid. It's like I'll probably be there when he says his first word. I'll probably be there when he first walks, because once I get to the teams and start deploying, gonna I'm going to miss a lot of stuff. Yeah. So we made the decision, like let's let's have our first kid, and from there we're like, all right, we're going to have, we're not going to like space them out by like ten years. Like we're going to have kids, and then we're going to be done having kids. And then we're going to be close together. So, um, yeah, and I, th- I think, yeah, of course, we started seeing that typical strain of me being gone and her dealing with kids and getting them to school and going through all that stuff. Yeah. And obviously, as they get to school, it gets harder and harder for her. So, yeah. Was there uh, any reflection on your part about your dad and, and you, you growing up? Like, did you start thinking about your lack of relationship did it did it start to kind of enter your mind at that point and you be that's, even more cognizant that's where it got stronger yeah. um you know the more i understood about special operations the more i understood about what his job was and where he'd gone and what he'd done um the more i understood like why he had to be gone and why it probably wasn't best that i lived with him while he was gone all the time mm-hmm. um so honestly it just it strengthened the relationship wow. um quite a bit yeah so, and now we're a lot closer than we used to be yeah that's that's awesome yeah um <clears throat> All right, so you get back from Africa. You're home for a year, 18 months-ish. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was the next deployment? So the next one, I had a pretty long break. So um, I got orders to go to SWIC, so it's Special Warfare Training Group. So after you spend a certain amount of time, you got you have to teach others something. So uh, I was a qualified mountain guy at the time, so uh, I went to the mountain school, which fortunately for me is right there at 10th group as well. So uh, I just walked across the street and I did my training tour uh, as an instructor at the mountain school. So um, did they, did you get a lot of really cool fucking like mountaineering schools and training and shit prior to that or during or before? No. Um, so what, what's funny is the, the mountain skill set is really, it's really unknown because it's, it's very small. Like we even only graduate at most like 48 guys a year. Um, and that's like at most, that's if ev- maxed out, if everyone graduates. So really it's a little bit lower than that. Um, but the training that you get, and this is going to sound biased and maybe it is a little bit, but it is so friggin' good. Like when a guy goes from knowing nothing, the amount of skills and his capability when he comes back just from the first level of mountain training is incredibly high, especially by civilian standards, like his ability to like to lead and set up repels because it's kind of like. It's an interesting skill set because not everybody on a team needs to be mountain qualified. That you need to teach them the basics, but you're really relying on the couple graduates of the course to push you through anything. You know, it's yeah. kind of as if like it's as if you're a jump master and none of your guys know what they're doing. Yeah. Which I guess is kind of like static lines. <laughs> but well, like, maybe more like a yeah. breacher. Like you need a couple guys who really know breaching. I mean, everybody needs to know how to slap a yeah. charge up and exactly. shotgun a door, but you really only need, you know, two or three guys that exactly. Yeah. And you're like you're putting your life on the line of that guy that knows what he's doing. Like, did his is his anchor set up correctly? Does he know that whatever rope system he's using has using has the strength 
or isn't running over something that could cut it because literally your guys' lives are on that line that you're setting up. So there's a lot of responsibility for guys who are qualified mountain dudes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say like the, the mountain program is pretty stinking good. What, um, uh, two questions. First, uh, the actual certification, it's not qualified mountain dude. Like what, like what is the, <laughs> yeah. what's the title? The qualified like, mountain dude number yeah. one. Uh, no. So it's actually changed a few times, even since I've been in. Uh, but during my last, uh, the last portion of my career, we've kind of solidified where it's at. So right now, um, we've changed it from like levels of one and two towards seasonal. So you've got summer mountain operators, um, which is almost, in, it's like the, I'd say it's the majority of the skill set is in the summer course, because that's where you're learning the actual craft. You're learning how to place protection. You're learning um, pulley theory. You're learning the rope systems, all the mountain stuff as a, that isn't ice climbing or skiing. Um, but you're learning basically the mechanics of the entire skill set. Yeah. So that's your summer guys. And then the next portion of the course is the winter mountain operator course, which is even, they only run one of those a year. So I think like every year you're only going to graduate maybe 20 guys in the wow. entire SOCOM enterprise that are going to be at that level. Wow. So that's why it's such a small skill set that not a lot yeah. of people know about. How long is the course? So they're both eight weeks long. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it, is it possible to kind of bullet list what you're capable of for each? Like summer, you can do X, 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 and X, or what? Like how, yeah. how do you break that down? Yeah. So um, if if you look at it as steep, exposed terrain, so at the point in which you need a rope to facilitate, that's now where your mountain guys have to come in. And you know, even though we train guys at a high standard for climbing, like hey, you need to be able to climb at this level and lead at this level. The expectation is when they apply that to a mission set is that they're not going to climb things that hard, yeah. but they're going to climb it with boots on. They're going to do it with a pack. They're going to have a gun. They're going to have guys that are tired. They might have, you know, indigenous guys with them and it might be shit weather and at nighttime yeah. because that's when we like to operate is at night. So you're going to apply those stuff. It's like resistance training. You work yeah. in the hardest environment and then operationally you're going to use those same systems in, in a more difficult, um, I guess a more higher consequence, so, you know, like yeah. a guy slipping and rolling his ankle on a mission, like that might be the end of your mission. Yeah. But if you can set in fixed lines and allow guys to move up without getting hurt, like, yeah. you know, that's huge. So, um, yeah, it, it allows the movement of men and equipment through technical terrain that's would be otherwise inaccessible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, is it kind of similar to say halo and hey, ho where, the, the amount of training required to be proficient at it is significant, mm -hmm. but the percentage of time that it's actually used opera operationally is very, very small. Like, do you find, like, what, what percentage yeah. are you actually using ropes and shit on real yeah. world missions? Um, I'd say it's probably pretty similar to that. Yeah. Um, so it's low. Yeah. Although, you know, the big difference between those things is, but, you know, when we look at the other specialties, we look at dive or we look at free fall, like, those are now granted. I know there's some stuff underwater that you can do that is operationally as well. But for the most part, we consider those infill platforms. Like, it gets you there. But once you're on, once your boots on the ground, you're you're a you're a normal team. You're doing yeah. normal team shit. Whereas the mountain skill set is a full time operational skill set. Like you'll be put in a mountain environment where you might be fighting guys who are in the mountains because you understand the mountains, or you might be servicing. Um, you might have an OP that's up on a rock face or whatever, and you're going to set up a system to where your guys can get up there safely yeah. uh, or set up repel, like repels for rapid egress for like a sniper team. Like you can support something like that. So I don't think it's quite as rare because yeah. the skill set is used. Like all the skills you learn in that could be used quite a bit, yeah. but like, you know, are there, are there guys who have done lead climbs and peeked over a rock and like smoked a guy with a freaking silent pistol or whatever? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. but not in, not in my world that I've yeah. seen. So, well, it's, it sounds like having that capability will open you up for a wider mission set also, like, yeah. because now it, it allows you access to places that without that capability you wouldn't have. Yeah. I guess kind of similarly to, to some of the hey-ho stuff, but um, is there a standard where like if, if you're a, a summer qualified graduate that you have to be able to, to say lead climb at a 510 a, like, is it that specific where you've got, yeah, to be able it is, to yeah, it is by grade. Um, so we, we've restructured the course quite a bit because, you know, the mountain skill set, when we first started, it wasn't, it wasn't even that long ago compared to the other skill sets. Um, 
we didn't really have that many experts. Mm -hmm. So they said, all right, well, this is going to be very military. And when it was very military, there wasn't enough technical learning involved. And then it like swung the exact opposite direction where it's like, hey, this is very technical. It's very civilian oriented. And we leave it on the guys to add the tactical stuff when they get back to the team. Yeah. And now we've really kind of centered on like the right amount of tactical and technical knowledge to be able to apply it. You know, yeah. we, we've created kind of the Swiss army knife of the tactical mountain operator. So, you know, when we're in the technical phase of the course, there is a requirement. Do you have to, you have to lead at, it was five, seven, it might be five, six now, but it was a five, seven. You have to be able to lead two other people with gear. Yeah. So with packs, multi-pitch climbs, um, you've got to lead the whole thing. And you're also getting tested on, you're getting tested on rescue. You're getting tested on, um, like pulley theory, you're getting tested on like all this stuff that supports that because like just being able to lead climb and put in pro and bring guys up something is one thing, but to be able to react if there's an issue yeah. is another one. Yeah. Um, and we want, we want guys who can be problem solvers because things don't go as planned yeah. ever, you know, yeah. and we yeah. want guys who have the knowledge to be able to apply it. You yeah. know, so no, it makes good sense. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a, a good hybrid mixing, mixing the two the way that you guys have. Yeah. As you guys know, uh, health and fitness is a big part of my daily routine and my lifestyle. I have a number of guests that come on that, uh, you know, that we talk about all, all sorts of things, health and fitness related, uh, diet, nutrition, et cetera. Uh, I started taking athletic greens a few months ago here uh, for that reason is that it's a uh, all, all encompassing vitamin and mineral supplement, 75 vitamins and minerals. Uh, it's lifestyle friendly, whether you do keto, paleo, vegan, it's dairy free, gluten free, uh, less than one gram of sugar. There's no uh, GMOs or nasty chemicals. There's no artificial anything in it. Uh, and it's just very nutrient dense and uh, and gives you that that supplementation that you need to combat cold and flu season coming up to bolster your immune system uh, and just help with a with a healthy lifestyle. Um, right now, the, the subscription, if you sign up for it, comes with a year's supply of vitamin D, which again uh, is, is crucial to uh, immune support, as well as five uh, on-the-go packets uh, with that first purchase. Um, whether you want to invest in, in your health or just supplement an, an already existing protocol that you have, uh, Athletic Greens has been a, a phenomenal staple uh, that I've added into my regimen, and I couldn't be happier to be working with them. Uh, if you want in on that deal, go to athleticgreens.com forward slash mic drop. Um, and they, they do a phenomenal job at uh, all the things that uh, health and fitness um, wise need to be done on a daily basis. So check them out. Go to athleticgreens.com forward slash mic drop and they will hook you up with that uh, special deal. Are you a, a sport climber by by hobby because of the amount of time that you've spent? Or? Yeah, there there was a time when I really got into it. Yeah. Um, when I was when I was an instructor there, um, I climbed a lot, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, um, I, I did some sport climbing. Most most was traditional climbing, but um, and for those who don't know the difference, sport climbing is like the route's already bolted for you. You know, it's an established route. You're going to go there and clip the bolts. Whereas traditional, you're you're using stuff you bring with you to put into the rocks for your own protection. So. Um, but yeah, I got into it and I was like pushing really hard, pushing grades. I think the hardest I'd ever climbed was, uh, I was leading like 11 C. Damn. Um, but I think that was like, that was definitely like at my best hardest. I don't, I, I wouldn't say I could climb every 11 B and 11 A out there. Yeah. But that's true. Um, traditional 11 C's. Yeah. God damn. Yeah. That's crazy. But I'd say I kind of hovered, I kind of hovered around the comfortable, uh, at nine, nine plus leading. Yeah. Uh, follow up to 511, a little bit higher than that, yeah. depending on the route. Yeah, yeah that's um, impressive. But that's when I was like really at my prime. Yeah. That's before I got into ice, which is a whole other totally story. Different. I love ice. That yeah. shit boggles my mind. I, I don't get it, honestly. Like, I mean, I, I understand the the requirement operationally to have to be able to, to do that or understand it and, and traverse it if necessary or whatever. What I don't get is the, the hobby aspect. I, I really don't. Yeah, I guess I mean, just I don't know. That's like um, I don't get base jumping either. <laughs> yeah. So a lot, a lot of guys from our yeah. communities do a lot of shit that I don't yeah, understand. I guess just uh, I don't know the thrill and the challenge. Yeah, and, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So you spend several years there. I'm assuming that was kind of a nice break and spent some time with the family and bolster your skill sets. But you're probably itching uh, to get back. Or? Yeah, I would say almost on the opposite of that. Oh, really? Um, it's a incredibly time intensive time oh, intensive okay. job. So yes, I was in Colorado. I wasn't deploying, but I was gone a lot. Yeah. You know, my my pillow to not pillow time at home 
you know, it was almost 50, 50, like I'd spend or probably over 200 days as an instructor yeah. just out somewhere. So my wife, she was the one who wanted me to be back on an ODA. She's like, oh, you know, at least when you're gone, you're gone. Yeah. Whereas now like you're here and then you're gone. Like there's not enough time for her to really get a routine. Yeah. So it was almost more irritating, yeah. especially when like, I don't know, like I don't want to say there's some animosity cause I don't want to paint it like a bad picture for my wife, but like, I've had fun jobs most of my career. Yeah. And when you do fun shit when you're gone and your significant others like dealing with stress and like dealing with kids, like it's hard not for them to hold that against you. Be like, you're out climbing and doing, you're out skiing, you're in camping and you're fucking. in Vail and doing all this stuff you like doing. And like, I'm here with the kids, you know? And it's not like it, I don't think it ever like came out direct like that, but I'm sure there was part of that that was felt sure. like you're out there living I don't know the life you want to live, you yeah. know? So yeah. Um, yeah, she was, she was ready for me to be back on a team. Yeah. Yeah. So you get back on a team, uh, where, where to next? So actually from there, uh, I, I decided that I was going to put in my paperwork to be a warrant officer. Um, I was like, you know, it's going to give me more time on the team and I don't just want to be a decision influencer. Like I want to be a, I want to be a decision maker. Like I want to grow a team and I want to do that. So like a shot um, caller. Would be a shot caller, yeah. an assistant shot caller. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> the assistant to the assistant regional yeah. manager. <laughs> Fucking office yeah. fan, I love it. <laughs> you and I are best friends. Right? Do go go do karate yeah. in the garage. Like, oh yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, so I went um, to the to the course at Bragg and uh, became a warrant and came back to uh, a different battalion um, to go take a mountain team. Yeah. So um, yeah, but still still probably one of the best moves I've ever made. And like I would. Man, I would highly recommend to anybody that if you're going to stay in, especially in SF, does it go warrant? Like, yeah. It's just like next level. It's like everything you loved about being on a team, but now you get to like manipulate and mold it just the way you want it. You yeah. know, you're looking five years down the road, not six months down the road. It just yeah. really opens your aperture um, and a lot of great opportunities that come out of that. So, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, what was the next deployment that you did? So the next one was Afghanistan. Um, was that, and that was uh, 2012, 13? 20, well, so let me see. So I did, I did three years as an instructor. I graduated the warrant course in 2015. Okay. And I think it was about within a year of getting to the team that we had gone to Afghanistan. That was my first trip to Afghanistan. Yeah. And I was like, I was excited about it because, you know, one of the things the special operations community understand is that your results may vary. And when you're always surrounded by guys, either from other groups or even from your own group that have gone, like Afghanistan was still considered like Wow. That was the word. That was where you get into it. Now, yeah. granted, there were a couple years in Iraq that were like really hot, but for the most part, everybody that had a wild story, everybody that had like your your multiple like, you know, Valor War winners, it was all Afghanistan. And I always just felt like I had missed out. I was like, man, like, if I haven't gone to Afghanistan, like, I'm I'm like not as I? cool as these guys. Yeah. yeah. And I think we have trouble in the community with that. Is that it's like, you know, everyone there's an expectation from the outside looking in that everybody's been in like vicious gun battles and everything. And it's like, look, man, like there's guys who left the team and maybe a month later their team got selected to be the guys who got to jump in and do some crazy kinetic raid. Like that happens all the time. Yeah. You know, guys miss out. And I just, I just constantly felt like I had missed out on super kinetic deployments because and, we weren't doing Afghanistan. And, until you went there. And boom, then we were. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so fortunately my, my two deployments as a warrant for a team was I got to take my team to combat, you know, twice Afghanistan, which was just awesome. So, yeah. yeah. So can you walk us through uh, those deployments? The first deployment, which I will say this is like pin ultimate dream deployment. Um, one, the adversary was awesome because we were, it was, we were selected for a counter ISIS mission. Um, we did really well in our pre-deployment train up. Like our team was super strong. You know, we, we really displayed that we had the aptitude to do things with very little supervision and a lot of assets. Um, so we got selected as one of two teams to do a counter ISIS operation. Um, in southeastern Afghanistan, so kind of right on the uh, right on the pack border, um, where a lot of those guys were funneling in, a lot of the foreign fighters, and a lot of that. And you know the the difference between fighting ISIS and fighting the Taliban. It's like again reaching back to my roots in the military and like putting yourself in the the mind of the person you're fighting. Like you know the Taliban is muddy. You know we've been there for such we've been there for such a long time. Some guys, they were there because they thought we were occupiers. Some guys were there because we, maybe we killed their uncle or whatever. Like, there was a lot of other reasons to be Taliban. And there's also a lot of corruption with the Taliban. You know, you might be fighting a guy who's, you know, getting paid off by the government because he protects their poppy fields and maybe he's related to two of your commandos. So, like, 
it was always super muddy fighting Taliban. And you never, you never knew if they were going to get tipped off. You never knew. It was just muddy. ISIS, on the other hand, like... Everyone hated ISIS. Taliban hated ISIS. We hated ISIS. Like, and they're just such a scourge. Like, they were like truly a disease. They were there, they were there purely to dominate. And like, you know, their atrocities that they're willing to commit because of that. You know, like they had no no <clears throat> issues like raping, murdering. Like they'd execute, you know, someone's husband right in front of the family. And like they just horrible shit. So was this ISIS K technically? Or? This was ISIS K. Yeah. yeah. Can yep. you can you kind of synopsize the distinction yeah so it's like isis and the khorasan which was like that kind of region like okay. just what they considered it yeah so it's regionally it's not it was regionally okay. and that's what we call them you know to everyone there it's daesh you know yeah. that's who isis was um but everybody hated them yeah. and uh we were working in an area that was like it was capture the flag with isis like they would take a village and then we would take back and re-emplace populace and like we would like so it was it was so rewarding to put people back in their villages and it was also in a mountainous area too. So like all that knowledge that I gained on like what it takes to live and operate in the mountains, we got to use that offensively against guys that had to use the mountains to move into country. So it was like everything lined up and it was, um, I don't know, it was just like righteous. Like it, it feels good to kill ISIS guys. You know, there's no qualms about it. You know, there's, I'm not happy about everybody that, that gets killed. Um, it'd be great if that wasn't the answer all the time, but when it's ISIS, it is the answer. And like, yeah, no qualms about it. Yeah, like, very black. Yeah, and white. Yeah. <laughs> very black and white. Yeah. yeah. The more we kill, the better. Uh, yeah. and I loved it. And we did very well with that. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was just such a thinking man's game because we were, we were at an outpost. Um, and which was when I say outpost, it like legitimately, not much bigger than this building. Uh, so small bombed out building that we kind of reinforced. We had a platoon of inf infantry guys that were attached to us and they were kind of our security element at night. They would be up in the towers and our little sand sandbag towers. How, like, how many is a platoon? Uh, like 30 some 30. guys. Yeah. Um, and then, so it was those guys. And then it was, you know, my detachment plus a couple of like uh, real close Afghans that worked with us. And then we had our commandos that stayed close at kind of a different base. Um, but yeah, like we were, we were out and in it at, at all times. Um, we didn't have like a big base where you could just like not have never be on guard and, you know, there was no Burger King. There was none of that. Like we were in the field, yeah. um, which was great. The Again, whole time. Towards the end, um, we went to a split team where I was running six guys who stayed in the Valley, um, for another like month or so. And then we finished the deployment, uh, like on another, not bombed out base like that, but, um, at like an actual base. But the majority of the deployment, majority of the deployment yeah. was just true cowboy, choose your own adventure. Like, you know, the con op process, you know, that, you know, that generally when you're going to go on a mission, especially, you know, as it got later in the deployment, it was more and more requirements. Like we need you to do this 30 page thing. that's going to have all these things laid up. Then you're going to brief it to the commander and all the staff are going to see it, all that, like our concept when we first got there and that was like five w's yeah written up and sometimes it was after hey we did this you know yeah and it was great so we had the freedom to operate which is why we were effective um yeah so and we had assets you know we had we had f-16s we had drones um and all that yeah. but uh our security our primary security was our relationship with the villagers um like you know they would they would give you heads up on shit that was yeah, going on like you know we weren't we weren't able to drive around in big armored vehicles like the roads were too small. So we were on ATVs and razors and that was how we had to get around. And, um, like we could have, we tried the, um, like MRAPs occasionally, but like those things would like a tire would drop, like break out part of the road and it would roll over and it's embarrassing and like incredibly intensive to roll a freaking however many ton vehicle back over. And just, so yeah, so we were, um, and in fact, you're more vulnerable at that point too, just dicking yeah. around with that situation. So, um, primarily, primarily we were on ATVs and razors. So when you think of how vulnerable we could be, if somebody was in an alley or if somebody was putting in like even a small IED with like toaster ATV. Yeah. So our ability to move throughout the area without getting messed up was directly related to the villagers faith in us and that we were showing them that we were there for them. Um, so, which is something I, I loved again, like going back to, you know, enjoying being with other cultures and enjoying like taking their problems and making it my problems. Um, it was just, it was so rewarding. And 
you know, we facilitated a lot of people getting released by ISIS or a lot of people that were like displaced and we'd be, be able to set the conditions for those guys to like come back or like reunite families. Was, so, was there any negotiation or this was all through force? All through force. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one question I had on the, I'm assuming you were the, the head mountain guy. Uh, did you have other mountain qualified guys in your yeah. yeah, we we at the time, and again, part of the fun of being a Warren is you get to build the team and you get to, um, I don't know, like make it what you want and get the right guys to the schools. So at one time, we were the most qualified mountain team in the, the entire regiment, probably entire special operations, because we had like, we had like four former instructors, like half the guys were summer mountain guys, you know, we had a bunch of winter guys too. So we had like stacked stacked mountain yeah. team which yeah. was great in that environment yeah. and it's it wasn't great in that environment because we were like climbing up ropes and sniping dudes and stuff but we just we understood how difficult it is to move in the mountains and because of that we were able to determine the most likely corridors be like hey if, if a bad guy's up here he's only going to be here for this long because for one there's no water up there there's no food and if he's going to get food and water up there it has to come through this route so we were able to use that to kind of develop our own intel on like, hey, here's the rat lines, here's how people are getting through. If we can shut this corridor down, either through like uh, fires or artillery, whatever, we can keep this corridor open for so long to allow this movement of friendly forces. Wow. So like we were able to really use that mountain knowledge yeah. and use it against them just by, just by understanding what it takes to be in that environment. It seems like, um, f at least for Afghanistan specifically, that it would be, it would have been really really beneficial to have like all special operations or, or even just having guys like you as as advisors for every fucking unit doing everything to provide that type of information i think would be game yeah. changer they had um they had these guys that i had kind of looked into it too just because the money was just phenomenal but they were like former team guys who would get attached to the infantry units or to, to like the major commands and they would be soft advisors <laughs> based off their experience. Yeah. Um, you know, we had we had one guy that did it and he was pretty good. He, he would, he'd been a, a CAG guy and then he was a, a CIA guy for a while. Um, so he knew the area really well and it was like really beneficial. Sometimes sometimes it was like, hey man, I, you're just an advisor, so let's just remember that. Yeah. But the other part was like, hey, I do appreciate everything you're bringing to the table. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like that was a very lucrative job for guys to go do that on the civilian side. Like, yeah. un, like yeah. unreasonable amount of money they were making to, yeah. doing that. But yeah, I um, can imagine. Yeah. Uh, so when, when you got into country, was there a, a sit down for you being the warrant where whoever your leadership was kind of said, hey, Brian, here's here's the fucking big mish. Here's why you're here. Here's the objective. Like w how specific were they in, in communicating to you what the, the job was for that one? It was pretty cut and dry. Yeah, it was like, hey, this is ISIS ter territory. We want it to not be ISIS territory. So it was it was that wide open. Just that like, just it. go fuck them up. Yeah, go wow. fuck them up. Yeah, again. Yeah, that's like, a wet dream. Again, like I'm yeah. saying, like I got to do everything that I ever wanted to do um, on that deployment. Yeah. As like, I felt like I did I did things that felt unconventional. You know, yeah. um, we did unilateral operations, like no commandos. You know, just team guys and maybe like a couple of your guys that you take with you to kind of look for IDs and stuff. But, uh, yeah. like, yeah, I got to do all sorts of really cool stuff on that. Can, uh, can you run, run through the highlight reel of, of what those things are? Like <laughs> yeah. Maybe man. pick one of each. Yeah. Like, you know, the more, uh, as I mentioned, like the more isolated you are, um, the more opportunity you have to do things. And in special forces, you're almost always going to be working with a partner force, a large partner force. And there's frustrations that come with that. They're never going to be as better, as good as you. They're never going to be like, they don't speak the same language. So there's always a, a barrier with your, with your terps and stuff. Um, but we were able to do things with very little Afghan support at some times, you know, one of them particularly, um, <clears throat> we had a Valley, so we had mortar systems set up and we had a guy that was super hot on mortars too. And I love mortars. And, uh, so yeah, we get up early me and like six guys. Um, and we go creeping up into the mountains, you know, set up a little hide site and we look and we can finally get eyes on legitimately this area we've constantly had problems for. And then we just started calling in mortars like a mother. And it was so darn effective. But it was also the point to it's like, man, like we don't have like our security is just our small little couple of guys right here. And just the, 
the ability to go out and do that as an SF guy without a bunch of Afghans is like really unique. So yeah, um, being able to do that was freaking awesome. But um, what what size mortars are you guys using? So we had eighty uh, ones and um, and the sixties. We had one twenties at the other little camp that was close to the other team that was working a different valley. Um, we didn't call them in as often, but um, yeah. And I'm a huge fan of freaking mortars. Yeah, yeah. What, I mean, so with those two sizes, what uh, what 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 was a realistic range uh, operationally during that that period? Uh, a couple k. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so a couple <clears throat> kilometers at, at most. Did um, they have any? Like enemy? Yeah. Uh, yeah, fairly ineffective, though. Yeah. yeah. They, just weren't, they weren't effective. They had rockets and stuff, but again, they weren't. It's, you know, it's hard to land something accurately in the mountains, too. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. yeah. Uh, funny thing about that, though. Um, so I don't think it's a big secret that we can usually hear what they're saying on open source radios. They're using little, like, icons. Yeah. So we have our guys listening in, and we had a dude call in mortars on himself and it was the funniest thing because our mortar guy who's like your stereotypical weapons guy he's like strong jaw big like caveman super smart dude but like total caveman like yeah. really really embraced the weapon specialist uh <laughs> like yeah. uh, mentality um and a super good friend so um we're shooting off mortars into uh into this valley just just because it's been quiet let's see what's happening uh we start hearing some chatter and it's like Hey, uh, they're shooting mortars. That one was kind of close. So he's like, all right. So he shoots another one. He's like, that one was closer. It was like 50 meters away. Like we're hearing this guy give us corrections on his own mortar. So oh, shit. Like, um, we're like, all right, sweet. So we're like, uh, you know, drop 50 fire for effect. Um, you know, <laughs> and we just launch a barrage in there. And then we hear the guy he was talking to calling back. Hey. Are you there? Hey, hey, <laughs> nothing. Boom. It was like the guy literally called in mortars, mortars on wow. himself, which was Jesus. like super entertaining on yeah. our end. Like we were like, oh my gosh, this is really happening. Yeah. So the, the instances where you guys were shooting mortars, um, like in, in that particular uh, day that you were talking about, did you get to go do any battle damage assessment afterwards or, or uh, was it usually in that environment that you weren't really picking up the pieces? No, nah, not usually. Yeah. You know, it was such a clear delineation between these are where the good guys are and these are where the bad guys are that we're just like, fuck them. Yeah, if yeah. it's if it's dead, it's dead, and it should be so. Um, yeah. You was know, it, whereas later on, you know, we get into like the other, you know, other deployment and, and counter Taliban stuff. That like your battle damage assessment was incredibly important. Yeah, and we'll get into that because that was like. Now you're fighting the Taliban while we're negotiating with the Taliban. Yeah. So now there's some very weird rules and very yeah. weird stipulations. Yeah. So I guess b before we get into that, some of the other like ISIS highlights, mm -hmm. um, what what stood out on that deployment is really rewarding unconventional stuff or, or just, you know, different operations you had. Yeah. And so I guess there's two, kind of two answers to that as far as like memorable and whatever, because there's memorable rewarding, which is getting people back to their homes and giving people hope which was just huge. Um, again, just like being able to take territory and hold it. And like we, when we took back one of these villages, um, it was a major operation. You know, we had air, uh, we had our commandos there, we had snipers out, we had machine gun, like a truly like awesome operation. And when you hear the enemy call on the radio to say that they have, they need more people just to help move all the dead bodies. Like, wow. like we have so, we have so many dead here that it's starting to smell and we can't support like, like we could hear their desperation. Like they knew that they were fucked. Yeah. Um, and then right after that, being able to put people, hey, this is your village now. ISIS doesn't own it. Freaking yeah. get back there. You know, it was like, it was awesome. Yeah. Um, super rewarding. Yeah, and cool. then, and then on the other side, you know, um, you know, I got I got kind of messed up on that trip. Um, like like mentally, uh, you know, part of being part of being the ground force commander, you know, is you're responsible for every munition that leaves the sky. And uh, one particular operation, um, we had a RON site set up, so it's a rest overnight. And we joke because technically the camp we're staying in was a RON site too, but it was like more like rest over a year. Like rest <laughs> it was a Roy site. <laughs> it was a Roy site yeah. or a ROM site. Yeah. This one was legitimately a RON site. And it was funny, they were all like funny named. We had like Ron Burgundy and like Ron, <laughs> I think this one was actually called Ron DeRousey. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, so um, I had a couple of my guys there. They were kind of pre-poed there. That way we wouldn't lose territory in preparation for a bigger operation to come. 
Um, so I had like a sniper team there, a bunch of our commandos, maybe like two or three other guys just kind of rotating in and out security. And I was ground force commander for that day. I also remember I had just gotten promoted that day. Uh, I'd made W2. So like it started off great. Like I was in a super good mood. Uh, we had AC 130 flying above and we get a call from the aircraft and they're like, Hey, we've got, we've got two guys, uh, kind of up in the hills messing around with something. I was like, all right, great. I hope they're bad guys. Let's keep an eye on them. And um, they call back and be like, yeah, definitely uh, two ADMs. So ADMs, adult males, that's usually what we're looking for. Um, looks like they're digging in a cache. I was like, all right, even better. This is just going to, you know, we're going to kill these dudes right off the bat and just have a great morning. Um, so they're like, hey, yeah, these guys, they just pulled AKs out. They're definitely moving towards your, your RON site. I was like, all right, sweet. Talk to the snipers on the radio and be like, hey, man, um, we're getting these reports. They're like, yeah, yeah, we see them. They're too far to engage, but like, like we can tell they're up there. All right. Awesome. So um, my thought on that one was like, because we were about to do an operation, I wanted to kind of send a message. So, you know, talking to the bird through our CCT, like, let's hammer down on these guys. Like, let's not just kill these dudes. Let's destroy the cash. And let's make sure that anybody else that is thinking about doing something today re rethinks their decision. Because in the end, as much as, you know, I like the opportunity to kill bad guys, I don't like the opportunity for them to kill my guys, you yeah. know, like, and if that means that we could just shock and all and speed of violence move through an objective faster than they can engage our guys, I'm going to choose that every time. Sure. Like there's no fair fight in war. It's not like, well, let's let them get closer and yeah, and overall. then we'll engage them with a like weapon. No, like why would I ever put yeah. a multi-million dollar special operator friend of mine in a position to where a freaking like teen with a rusty ass AK could shoot him, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, one, one of my favorite sayings as it relates to special operations is if you ever find yourself in a fair fight, you've done something horribly wrong. And uh, yeah. I agree, like stack the deck in your favor to the best of your ability every time. Yeah. Like, you know, <clears throat> nightmare scenario of like, yeah, do I want my guys to have to freaking go in into a barricaded PKM into a building? Yeah. Heck no, man. Like, that's not worth it. Like, how much is that guy worth? No. Yeah. So it's being smart about it. But either way, um, going back, I was like, yeah, like, let's hammer this thing down. So um, AC-130 opens up. And, like, for those who haven't um, who haven't seen or watched an AC-130 pound something, it's, like, it's it's incredible. Like, because the distance, too, you know, you're seeing the, you're seeing the, you're hearing report or you're seeing the puffs of smoke and they're mismatched and you're just, like, just watching a freaking airplane shoot howitzers out of it. And, and they unloaded with everything, everything they had, um, not all their ammo, but like every munition, you know, they put on a show. So I was like super pumped. They're like, yeah, these guys are dead. Totally. Um, you know, so I was like, yeah, that's great. So a little while later, my snipers report, they're like, Hey, um, there's people going up to the bodies. It looks like, it looks like there's some women going up to them. We're like, no, we're like, okay, well, let's keep an eye on them. See what they're doing. Um, it's like, it looks like they're trying to hide the weapons. We're like, huh, okay, well, that's weird. Well, not long after, we get a call from um, one of our local police guys, a shady character, but either way, he's our character. So um, he calls and says, hey, the, uh, the village is saying that you just killed, killed a couple of kids. And we're like, no, no, no. We saw it. Like, they were bad guys. They had guns. 